Well, folks, it's a big day. Public count over $2 million here today, uh, sitting on a $160,000 plus dollar gain for the day here today, okay? So in this video here today, I want to speak about where do we go from here with the public count? You know, what am I looking to move around? And, you know, certain positions are getting so big. Am I looking to maybe start cutting some of those and uh, moving some money in, in elsewhere and things like that? So we'll go through all that. We're going to talk about kind of where we go from here. Um, I want to give some good advice, hopefully, to everybody out there throughout this video here today on some things I've learned over the past few years that hopefully you can adapt. And, you know, I, I've definitely had a lot of people reaching out saying congrats to me. Also, congrats to you guys. I know there's a lot of people out there that are reaching new milestones in your portfolios, whether it be, you know, five figures, six figures, seven figures, just a record amount and things like that. So congratulations to you guys as well. Um, you know, you got to put in the work and, and make the investments and those sorts of things. And you guys are doing that and you've done pretty well for yourself. So I want to say congratulations to you guys as well. Trevor sent me this over today, T-Man. He's the one that sends out the five-figure awards for the Patreon members. And uh, yeah, it looks like eight new people are getting five-figure awards. They just hit $10,000 plus in their portfolios. So congratulations to those individuals there. That's big time, man. And then uh, we've definitely seen a big uptick in terms of private group members with six-figure trophies and seven-figure trophies. So, you know, that's great to see. You know, a lot of people having a lot of success out there. And, um, you know, you know, just got to stay balanced, stay focused in this market and, you know, weather the uh, weather the down markets it's always a roller coaster ride right and um you know time periods like this just enjoy it because you know record after record can be hit for quite some time before you have the, kind of the next downturn there okay so that's going on there okay i need two things from you guys before we get into this smash a like that helps the channel out and also make sure you subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of my videos in the future if you're looking to join my private stock group and take your game up to the next level that will be pinned comment down there and uh, you can learn, you know, very in-depth, everything you need to know. I know there's, there's some people, you might be watching this, you might have got lucky. I'm just going to call it what it is. Some of you guys might have got lucky. You might be hitting five figures recently, six figures, seven figures. And maybe you don't really understand financial statements or understand how to value companies or project numbers out in the future and things like that. You know, the stakes have gone up now. It's bigger amounts of money. It's, you know, you've got to start taking the stuff more and more serious the more money you got. So if you're ready to do that, pin comment down there. And um, there's a reason we've had, you know, such a ridiculous amount of people go through the program over time and uh, have lots of success. All right, guys. So let's start going through this. So first of all, where I want to start today's videos, what a four year journey. Um, you know, if I go back and if I think about going into 2020, it was pretty bullish. I'll be honest with you guys. There was a pretty good feeling about the economy, the state of the economy, the state of the stock market as well, where the Federal Reserve was at, where inflation was at. Going into 2020 was a pretty, I would say, comforting feeling. I would say it was overall bullish going into 2020. I remember going into 2020 feeling pretty decent about the market, about business, about investing about everything, to be quite frank. There was, you know, uh, nothing that really jumped out at me that really concerned me going into 2020. Now, once 2020 started, obviously, oh boy, you know, things fell off really quickly. We had the biggest black swan event maybe in the past hundred years, right? Which was obviously Rona that came out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, the rumor started in January, 2020, and then they started to really ramp up in February, 2020. And by March of 2020, it was like, it was here. It was real. It was like, oh my gosh, this is actually like, they're going to do this. They're going to close down the world. Like this is crazy. Right. And so all of a sudden things got insanely bearish. Right. And they were, they were insanely bearish for quite a while. Even once the market started to come back, things were still overall bearish, I would say, because a lot of people were didn't know like what was going to happen. Were we going to be closed down for years? Like, um, you know, a lot of people didn't know a lot of things, right? How is business going to bounce back? Things like that, right? And by the time we went into going into 2021, there was the most bullish market I've ever seen in my life. Um, I don't know if I'll ever see a bullish market that bullish again. And maybe I will, but it might be 10, 20 years from now. It was ridiculous. I mean, going into 2021 was just, it was through the roof in terms of bullishness, right? People were feeling so great. Uh, the world's going to open back up soon. You know, we're going to defeat Rona. Oh my gosh, the stimulus money. Look at company earnings were bouncing back insanely strong. Crypto was running huge. Real estate prices were starting to appreciate. Whew, there was just euphoria all over the place, right? I mean, just, I, I've never seen it like that before. And, you know, everybody was convinced they're going to be a millionaire. Everybody wanted to get into investing going into 2021. It was, it was a whole situation, right? And then, you know, some of that died down a little bit, but I would say overall going into 2022, that was bullish as well, right? Until 
the Federal Reserve started taking inflation serious and they started raising rates. And that caused the crash of 2022, which was absolutely vicious. I mean, one of the most brutal crashes we've seen in the market, the most brutal crash we've seen in the market, to be quite frank, since the great financial crisis. That was a brutal crash. You know, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. It, now, going into 2023, people remained, you know, super bearish, super, super bearish, right? I mean, just no one was feeling really great about the market. And then going into 2024, I would feel, I don't feel it was bullish going into 24. I also don't feel it was bearish. It was kind of just like a neutral feeling to the market. You have some people over here still bearish, sticking with their bear calls. You have some people bullish. You have some bulls that are kind of more neutral that are like, eh, I don't know, this could kind of go either way. So I would just say a little bit of a more of a neutral market in 2024, right? Now, to illustrate kind of the crash of, of 2022 and how vicious that was, like I said, it's the worst crash we've seen, in my opinion, since the great financial crisis and arguably since the tech bubble. But it was, it was insane because the indexes didn't quite show it as much because oil and gas stocks held up decent, healthcare held up, some of those things. But what are all the stocks that people actually care about? They care about the MAG7, right? What does everybody talk about? The MAG7. Tesla, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Google, Apple, Meta, Amazon. These stocks run the stock market. They run the world, right? And what happened to those stocks? Amazon fell over 50%, peaked to trough. Apple fell over 30% peak to trough. Meta fell over 70% peak to trough. Remember, these are the best, strongest, greatest companies in the world. Google fell over 30% plus peak to trough. NVIDIA fell over 50% peak to trough. Microsoft fell over 30% peak to trough. And Tesla fell over 70% peak to trough, right? Then you go a layer beneath that. AMD, 50% plus drawdown. Shopify, 70% plus drawdown. Netflix, 70% percent plus drawdown peak to trough right from where they peaked in late 2021 versus where those stocks were you know uh, in 2022 at the lows i mean it was insane insane um yeah well, well we'll eventually get another crash like that but it might be a while even when we get the next big recession you know which will be a big unemployment recession whenever that comes that, that could still be years away we'll see where all that plays out maybe it's in the next year maybe it's three years five years out we'll have a big unemployment recession again where unemployment will go to seven ten percent but I can tell you this, the chances that you're going to see the greatest companies in the world fall 70, 80%, I would say pretty low. Those stocks will fall a lot. They'll fall 30, 40, 50%. But those sorts of drops, that was a freak situation where you went so insanely bullish to so insanely bearish in a matter of months. It wasn't in years. It was in a matter of months. Okay. There was a freak situation there and the Fed couldn't save the day which is so different than almost every other situation where, where, you know, let's say some black swan event, the Fed can just drop rates down to zero. They can do whatever they got to do. They stimulus, blah, blah, blah. Because that was a freak situation where we had inflation of eight, nine, 10% almost. Uh, you know, if you looked at true inflation, the numbers were double digits at some points, right? You know, that was a freak situation. And the chance you get into that again, well, you know, is a long time from now in, in order that, right? Some, some areas of the market still haven't even recovered, right? Fintech's a great example of this. Now, these stocks have bottomed, but they haven't really recovered yet. The recovery for these sorts of stocks still has to come, which is shocking that it's, you know, this far out and, you know, there's still areas of the market that still have to recover. Small caps still have to recover. You know, these things have bottomed, but they haven't actually recovered yet. That still has to play out here, folks, okay? This is a whole game here, right? Now, if I think about the way I was treated personally, right, online, I've been on YouTube and on social media since 2016. Going into 2020, I was definitely treated like a god, I'll be honest with you guys. And why do people treat me like that? It was really on the back of Tesla's success. And being the person that really saw Tesla, was talking about Tesla. It was really me and one other guy, his name was Galileo at Hyperchange, that we would always talk about Tesla and you know how bullish we were and what we saw for the future. And so being that I got that right and that stock exploded higher, you know, I definitely was being treated very well going into 2020, okay? And then going into 2021, it was still like a, being treated like a god. It was insane, right? Then going into 2022, I started kind of getting treated like a devil. People started talking a lot of trash about me. Going into 2023, treated like a devil. Oh my gosh, I'm the worst person in the world, right? And then going into 2024, I would say a little bit more neutral, right? I don't think I am being was being treated like a god going into this year. I also don't think I was any longer being treated like the devil. It's just kind of like neutral, right? And then all in is just a matter of a few years, right? Which is fascinating, like how fast things can flip from like being treated like a god to being treated like a devil to like, oh, okay, we're kind of neutral now at this point in time. And at the end of the day, you know, my dad told me a great saying, you know, when I was a kid, he used to say, you know, this world's about what have you done for me lately? And um, 
you know, that always kind of stuck with me ever since I was a child. And it's the most true statement. You know, if my stocks are doing great, man, people treat me great. If my stocks are doing bad, man, do they treat me bad. It's just, what have you done for me lately? That's the world we live in, okay? And so always remember that for you out there. You know, same thing at your job, same thing at your business. What have you done for me lately? You don't do your customers right in the short term. They're like, man, they start treating you bad, okay? And, you know, this uh, saying I heard recently, and I love this one. It says, live for the cheers, die by the booze. If you live for the cheers, you'll die by the booze. And man, do I love that one. Because it's so honestly true. Because, you know, if I'm going to live for people to treat me like a god and tell me how great I am, well, guess what? It's going to kill me inside when they're treating me like trash. And they're saying I'm, I'm trash and I'm garbage and this and that, right? It, so I think that's a little food for thought in regards to that as well, right? It was interesting, you know, somebody from my team, oh man, he sent me this. And it was like a very positive message overall. And I said, man, uh, every time I see something like that, I say to myself, you better effing remember that next time we're in a bear market and not turn on me. Because <laughs> it's so true, right? Because I, I watched it, man. I watched it. I, I watched how quickly people turn from just being like, I was the greatest thing ever to just like, I was the worst thing ever. And it was just like, wow, man, that happened fast. That, that that really happened fast, right? And then it can switch the other way. Well, wow, people go from treating you so bad to wow, they treat you really good, right? Just depending upon how your stocks are doing, right? Now, they created some trust issues with me. I'm not going to lie about that in regards to kind of being, you know, a public figure and kind of, you know, things like that definitely created some trust issues. I don't approach things the same. I don't approach social media the same as I did, you know, several years ago. Heck, I don't even think I really smile for thumbnails nowadays like you know, I used to. It took away definitely some innocence from me um, after being treated the way I was treated for, you know, almost two years. It was, it was vicious, right? And, you know, it kind of put it almost similar to like if you get cheated on by a man or a woman or whatever, right, in a relationship. And you don't really approach things the same after that. Kind of like, mm, okay, I see how this is. And you, you change up your approach a little bit in terms of the next relationship, which you have to do, or you're going to fall to the same pattern again and again and again. So with me personally, you know, some trust issues were created there and I approach things differently now at this point in time, right? As, as this saying, I love this saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. As a hundred percent the way I feel in regards to that. Also made some changes, right? You know, I don't really mess with my peers anymore, Right. I don't watch my peers. They're my, they're the big finance YouTubers. I don't watch them. I don't pay attention to what they're up to, what they're doing. I don't mess with them. You don't see me collabing in videos with them nowadays. I don't do any of that, right? I know they all watch me, though. I know they all watch me, though. And, uh, you know, the reason I really don't do that is, you know, I just saw them, the way they, they turn certain ways and just... You know, a lot of bad stuff. I don't even want to get into it. I'm so past all the drama phase of 2022 at this point in time. But, um, you know, I saw the way things were, were there. And so, you know, I, I mess with who I mess with now. And, I'm, you know, outside of that. And the people I really mess with are a lot of the small YouTubers that are on the come up and things like that. Because those ones actually have, you know, real appreciation for you. The problem with the big YouTubers is, you know, they get big. They get big heads. And then they forget who paved the way for them, right? Which, just to be quite frank, it was me and my neighbor, and I don't want to mention his name because I know he's way too humble to, to put him out like that. But, um, you know, it was him and me. We set this whole game up. And then every one of these big finance YouTubers would never have existed if it wasn't for us. I promise you that. Because we knocked the door down. We showed it was possible. We showed it was possible to grow big channels. And then they all started to jump on. And then, you know, now they got big heads. And anytime they get a moment to trash either one of us, I've always noticed they always do that. And, uh, you know, throw us under the bus and try to make us look bad and things like that. And it's like, man, you don't even appreciate, like, what was laid out for you so you could do this thing. And, uh, but, you know, and it's not like that really in other industries. If you look at, like, sports, like, people always pay the people respect that kind of paved the way, like, oh man, you, you paved the way for this. You opened the door here there where there was nothing. And like, wow, you know, music's like that. Music, people show appreciation to the OGs all the time. You know, it's just, it's funny. You know, YouTube is just not like that. It's just not enough professionalism there. Or people explain the history or anything like that. So it is what it is. So I just kind of stay out of all that stuff and, you know, stay out of all that drama as well, which I really like. Now, what I care about, what I, what it also really focused me on, right? Because I used to really care about, you know, trying to make other YouTubers successful. And I would have them over at my house all the time and teach them stuff. And, oh, you could do this and try to help them and for free, for free. And, um, you know, I realized that that was a waste of time. So what do I focus on nowadays? Me, 
making sure I'm good, making sure my family's good, right? I focus on my private stock group members. I focus on my Patreon members, the people that actually support me and my family, and my loyal viewers, right? The ones that, you know, are here all the time and you guys show up and you enjoy the videos and, and all those sorts of things. And that's where my focus is. And then the rest is whatever the rest is. Whatever that's going to be is whatever that's going to be. Um, but that's, that's where my priorities are and that's where my focuses are, okay? So let's talk about the public account here. Uh, I mean, it's, it's more top heavy than it's ever been. Uh, Meta is now f almost 43% of the portfolio. It could approach 50%. I mean, it's getting out of hand, right? And I, I can't sell Meta. I cannot sell Meta. I think I'm going to be able to get out of this situation. And I'll explain to you in just a moment how I think I'm going to be able to get out of this situation. But the position's gotten so big that every little bit now, Meta goes up. It's like a substantial number, right? I mean, think about them. So the position's now $864,000, right? So let's say on Monday, Meta goes up one percentage point. That's $8,600 in a day, right? On one percentage point move. A three percentage move is like a decent day, right? So three percentage points. Now we're talking about, you know, $25,000 roughly. Whew. So that's the thing I got kind of working against me here, but I, I have something working for me that, I, that I'll talk to you in a moment here. But yeah, Meta, I can't sell it because it's still undervalued. Like if Meta was 800 today or 1,000 today, I might be able to say, okay, let me start cashing out some profits. It's trading at, I can't trade Meta. Meta's trading right now probably at a, you know, somewhere between a 20 and a 25 forward P for a company that just grew revenues 25%. I can't, like valuation wise, it doesn't make sense to sell right now at all. So, you know, I just have to hold and just, you know, it is what it is, right? No, I think there's a few ways of kind of getting out of this a little bit in terms of top heaviness. One is I think PayPal is going to start rolling very soon here. It could happen as soon as it's earnings. I think they're going to announce probably a big job cuts along with a decent earnings report and a good conference call. And I think, you know, that could start the momentum in regards to PayPal. So I think PayPal is, you know, going to start moving very shortly here. Elf on a shelf, you know, everybody's kind of waiting on Elf's numbers here. Like, what's going to happen? And so if they report another great earnings report, that baby's flying again. So that will become a bigger weight, which that's already a pretty big weight. That's, uh, let's see, Elf on a shelf. That's 8.38%. So if Elf goes on a big run, let's say, you know, they really come through with great numbers here and the stock shoots to 200 plus. Okay, now that's going to, you know, obviously become a bigger weight here. Okay, so there's a potential. By the way, PayPal earnings are Wednesday. I will be live streaming that on Twitch. That's going to be a massive live stream. So just, you know, put that in your phone, put that in your calendar, remind yourself to join me Wednesday, starting around noontime Pacific time on Twitch for that PayPal live stream. That's going to be insane. Okay. Uh, we're going to react to the numbers and the conference call. Then the third is I'm building new positions right now. So I'm not adding new money to Meta. I'm adding, you know, fresh money to new stocks. So that should help kind of offset things, you know, because I buy every week $500 worth of stocks. Okay. Third thing is Amazon should keep rolling. I'm not expecting the momentum to die anytime soon. Obviously, there will be pullbacks here and there, you know, like every other stock in the market. And like, you know, if we have a downtrend in the market for a bit, right? But overall, I think, you know, Amazon is going to keep rolling. The numbers are just too good to not keep rolling. So I think that will, you know, help kind of offset the percentage there. And then fifth is I think Tesla is actually going to come back in the second half of the year. I really do. I really do. I'm, I feel pretty confident in that. Confident enough to buy short-term call options? No, heck no, okay? But I feel pretty confident Tesla could start coming back in the second half of the year. Once we get past this initial Cybertruck ramp over the next couple quarters, and that baby really starts flowing, I think that will start being margin accretive, profit accretive. You know, the, the price cuts have been what they've been. I just don't see any price cuts past this quarter. I just don't. And if anything, I see in the back half of the year potential price rises, so I think I think the problem I think Tesla's margins are literally bottoming out in this quarter we're in right now this first quarter and I think there's a decent probability that margins could go up a bit in the second quarter but I'm not super confident about that it might be like kind of steady and then I think third quarter margins start going back up into the fourth quarter margins go up and then Mar Tesla starts becoming oh a profit story again a margin story and and a growth story again all simultaneously. And, you know, once once all those pieces come together, Tesla will start moving. It'll move rapidly after that. So, you know, that's kind of my opinion there. So that will kind of offset a little bit, right? 
Now, in terms of the next milestones to celebrate here on the public count, three million is the next one. That's always the number I've had in my head, like, wow, three million. Like, we're going there with the public count, right? And then $5 million, and someday $10 million when it's going to be an eight-figure portfolio. That will be huge, man. I can't wait, you know, because the public count, we started that, that was probably, oh gosh, six years ago and some change, I think the public count started. So, you know, to build it up to where it's at now, I'm very happy with that. But yeah, we're on the, we're on, we're going to go to three and we're going to go to five and we're going to go to 10. And, you know, some of these milestones will happen a lot quicker than I ever anticipated. Others will be longer, right? I remember a million for the public count happened way faster than I anticipated. And a lot of that was because of Tesla went up so much and that was a big position in the portfolio. But then like 3 million, I think is taking a lot longer than I anticipated because I, you know, the crash of 2022 happened. And so that like sent us down, then it was kind of like a climb back up. So who knows, maybe 3 million happens way faster than I anticipate. Um, maybe 5 million happens way more anticipate. And then maybe like 10 million, like seems like it takes forever, right? Because then we have another crash at some point. So that's kind of the, the game of the stock market and being a long-term investor is like the roller coaster ride, like up, 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 and then all of a sudden down and then up, 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 and then a big down. And then it's like, you know, cl- climbing back and that's fine. You just got to let that play out. Like that's going to be what that's going to be, you know, as part of being a long-term investor. Now, as far as what Fidelity has us at on a five-year return, uh, crushing S&P 500, destroying bonds, you know, across the board, um, you know, yeah, that's a ridiculous compounded annual growth rate there that Fidelity has us at. You know, you can get great, great returns on stocks, but you've got to have a few things. You've got to put in the work. You've got to stay focused in this game. And you've got to have the strategy and understand like how to do this stuff. You've got to understand balance sheets, income statements. You've got to listen to conference calls. Not everybody wants to do that. And so those people are called gamblers. You don't want to listen to a conference call and you want to put money in a stock. You're a gambler. That's fine. Like just you, know, you can gamble your money, right? That's not, that's not an investment. You're not thinking about it hard enough if you're not, not willing to listen to a conference call, right? If you're not willing to look at an income statement or a balance sheet and you put money in a stock, you're a gambler. And gamblers can sometimes can win at the casino. I, I won at the win the other night, right? Sometimes you can win, but over the long term, that's you're not going to win. I can tell, promise you that. So if you want to win over the long term, you've got to understand how to do all this stuff. And I can teach you all that in the prep stock group. So if you're ready to take things up to the next level and learn in depth, join us in the prep stock group. Pin comment down there because you don't want to be a gambler who gets lucky. You know, be a real long term investor. All right, guys, much love and have a great day.